Hello everyone, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine. Today I am talking coronavirus once again with important updates on the disease's spread, and there's a lot to talk about. Community transmission now occurring within the US, whether it's accurate to call it a pandemic yet, and of course, whether it's time to start panicking. Before any of that, let me first talk about the name, because not everyone has heard yet that this virus and this disease have been renamed. Two and a half weeks ago, there were joint announcements. In one, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses announced that novel coronavirus 2019 has been formally renamed SARS-CoV-2 in order to highlight its genetic similarity to the original SARS virus. This made sense to, to virologists, but there was some criticism that people might mistakenly link SARS-CoV-2 to the more deadly SARS disease of 2003 caused by the virus now generally known as SARS-CoV-1. Meanwhile, the WHO named the disease caused by this virus COVID-19 for Coronavirus Disease 2019. I personally think they took a confusing name and made it even worse. But I won't talk any more about disease naming conventions today. That was the topic of my last video about the outbreak. So let's move on and talk numbers. The number of cases, the number of fatalities, the case fatality rate, and how many countries we're talking about. As of February 29th, confirmed cases in China are up to 80,000, while the rest of the world has 7,000. Deaths in China are at around 2,900. The rest of the world has seen about 100. The disease has now been found in over 60 countries, including particularly notable outbreaks in South Korea, Italy, and Iran. The case fatality rate for COVID-19 has remained 2 to 2.5% when considering all cases, but there are very important predictors of mortality. First, it's very age-dependent. In the first six weeks or so of the outbreak, the measured case fatality rate ranged from literally zero among children under nine to 15% among those 80 and over with an inflection point between the ages of 60 and 70. The presence of chronic disease is predictably a risk factor, especially cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases like COPD, and diabetes. Being male has been identified as a risk factor for death, though it's not yet known if that's an independent risk factor or if it's due to confounding factors like men in China being much more likely to smoke than women. And there's also an important difference in case fatality rate between countries. For example, the measured 2 to 2.5% overall rate is mostly driven by China, since that's where the vast majority of cases still are. But outside China, the rate appears to be closer to 1% or even less. Possible explanations for the difference include China failing to identify mild cases, which makes their case uh, fatality rate falsely elevated, or the excess deaths in China is because their healthcare system is stretched well beyond the capacity to deal with this. For example, there just aren't enough ICU beds and ventilators for the most critically ill there. So the rate in the US and Europe, when the full brunt of the disease hits us, will likely be under two and may even be under one. But it's too early to say yet with any confidence. Iran, on the other hand, has reported 43 deaths among 600 cases, a remarkable 7% case fatality rate. This is almost certainly because they've been struggling to identify milder cases rather than because the disease or the virus are somehow different there. After all, Iran, it's not really an obvious place for a coronavirus to have spread early on, and so the country was probably particularly unprepared for it. There have been a few particularly notable stories about the virus's spread. These include the nightmare quarantine of the cruise ship Diamond Princess off Japan, after a handful of passengers tested positive for the virus. As many as 700 cases have been linked to the ship, and it will be an interesting investigation as to how many of those cases and ultimate deaths were directly caused by the, in retrospect, terrible decision to quarantine the passengers on board rather than evacuate them, and due to the reportedly lax onboard quarantine procedures. Another important story about the outbreak concerns South Korea where their local outbreak has been strongly linked to a religious group called the Shinjongji Church of Jesus, who happen to believe their founder is the literal second coming of Jesus Christ. 
This group was particularly prone to facilitating the spread because of the style in which they worship. They're packed together very closely and frequently shouting during services, spreading respiratory droplets. Uh, they also reportedly encourage worshipers to come to services even when ill. And both the church is secretive, um, and, and the ch church is secretive about membership uh, due to the fear of members being ostracized in the community, which makes tracking down case contacts for public health officials much more difficult. These situations with the Diamond Princess and the Xinjiangji Church highlight the, the diverse challenges that exist when trying to contain an epidemic. And then there is the news story about community transmission here in the U.S. There have now been two confirmed cases of COVID-19 here in California who have no relevant travel or known contact history. One in Solano County on 226 and one announced on 228, just one town away from where I work at Stanford. We have no idea how they became infected. Though notably in that first case in Solano County, that's very close to Travis Air Force Base where some of the evacuees from the Diamond Princess were isolated upon returning to the U.S., and from where there were some horrifying stories about staff being untrained and unequipped to be interacting with possible coronavirus cases. That could be a coincidence, but maybe not. It certainly seems a little suspicious. There are also probable coronavirus cases in Oregon and Washington, who saw their first uh, coronavirus death today. Um, and these, these cases have no obvious source of transmission. And uh, there's a long-term care facility in Washington in which over 50 people, half patients, half staff, are reporting symptoms. Overall, these new cases are important for three reasons. First, this is the first evidence of community transmission in the U.S., where one person from the community uh, who has no contact to China or, or Asia is transmitting to somebody else. We are likely at the inflection point where the number of cases are going to start climbing much more quickly. This won't be predominantly because of a sudden overnight explosion of cases, but rather an artifact of the fact that testing is becoming more widespread. Community transmission has almost certainly been going on here for several weeks undetected. People feeling mildly ill and assuming that they just have a bad cold or the flu. There are probably dozens if not hundreds of Americans walking around with coronavirus, though not all are equally contagious. The second reason is that there is uh, early evidence of potential spread in healthcare facilities. At least in the Solano County case, there was a significant delay in the diagnosis, in that case because the CDC initially declined UC Davis's request to test the patient for coronavirus. This led to healthcare workers potentially being exposed. Combining this with the fact that it's believed that asymptomatic individuals can spread the disease, it's easy to imagine hospital-based spread could have occurred to other patients, which may have happened at the facility in Washington. Given that we have no vaccines, and that the mortality rate is particularly high in the elderly and the chronically ill, the idea of outbreaks occurring in hospitals and nursing homes is really scary. And the third reason is that the UC Davis case in particular highlighted the potential problem with the CDC serving as the sole gatekeeper to coronavirus confirmation testing in the United States. Had UC Davis had access to the test directly, many fewer healthcare workers would have been potentially exposed. However, the problem with COVID-19 testing, it's actually a lot more complicated than just we need to be testing more people. That's kind of a huge rabbit hole that I'm, I'm not going to jump down right at this moment. And at least as a few days ago, the CDC has um, approved strategies to increase test availability. So hopefully this will soon not be quite as big a problem. This brings me to one of the key questions for today. Has coronavirus or COVID-19, if you prefer, crossed the threshold to becoming a pandemic? To answer that question, we need to first discuss what is a pandemic. It actually does not have a universally agreed upon definition, but one definition used by the WHO is, quote, an epidemic occurring worldwide or over a very wide area, crossing international boundaries and usually affecting a large number of people. This is sufficiently vague for, that for better or worse, the WHO can apply slightly different standards to different diseases, depending on how they want to message preparedness to the public and how they want to allocate resources. 
That's not the WHO being devious, but rather gives them a little flexibility in combating different diseases because not all worldwide outbreaks warrant the equivalent response. The WHO Director General has recently further clarified that a determination of whether a disease should be classified as a pandemic is based upon its geographical distribution, the severity of the associated disease, and the impact it has on society in general. Almost four weeks ago, in a prior video here on Strong Medicine, uh, I asserted that coronavirus remained an epidemic and not a pandemic at that time. A few viewers took exception to that, but my position was consistent with the overwhelming majority of experts, was consistent with the fact that about 99% of cases were located in China, and that there was no significant outbreak focused in any other country. Fast forward a month, though, things now look very different. While the U.S. has been largely spared so far, at least as far as we know, with just over 60 known cases, most of whom are Diamond Princess evacuees, there are now 3,500 cases in South Korea, 1,100 in Italy, and 600 in Iran. And these numbers are climbing very quickly. As I said earlier, at the time of recording this, there are now about 7,000 cases outside of China across more than 60 countries. By tomorrow, that number could easily be at 8,000. There's even discussion that consideration should be given to canceling the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. While I'm not an epidemiologist, this feels like, to me, coronavirus has crossed the pandemic threshold. For what it's worth, the WHO and CDC are still saying not a pandemic yet. It's being classified as a, quote, global health emergency. However, pretty much everyone else is saying that it will become, I'm sorry, pretty much everyone is saying that it will become a pandemic at some point, if not one already. Unfortunately, the common wisdom is that this has obviously been a pandemic for a while now, and by common wisdom, I mean what everyone's uncle is saying on Facebook. So when the WHO and the CDC are saying, you know, we're, we're not quite there yet, it's leading to a major credibility problem. I don't think the credibility problem is completely justified, but it's nevertheless leading the public to become increasingly skeptical of everything else those institutions are saying, and that's going to get increasingly dangerous as the number of cases rises. So why does it even matter? I mean, why do we care what we call it? Why do we care if it's an epidemic or pandemic? What difference does it make? Well, once it's labeled a pandemic, the broadest public health goals start to shift a little. If the disease has spread worldwide, containment within one country or one part of the world has obviously failed. So travel bans like the U.S. restricting Chinese citizens from visiting here lose their effectiveness. We aren't there yet. I think quarantining returning travelers from certain parts of Asia, that's still appropriate, but that probably won't be true for too much longer. So once we give up on containment, what should the focus be? It becomes mitigation, trying to slow down the spread in order to give time for vaccine development, to give time to study antiviral medications, and to prevent a huge surge in the need for ICU beds, a surge which many hospitals are not prepared to handle. In addition to frequent hand washing, mitigation involves something called social distancing. Social distancing consists of five basic primary measures. Isolation of sick individuals, a home quarantine of close contacts of those sick individuals, changing work patterns to allow more people to work from home or to spread out shifts so that there are fewer people at work at one time, canceling large group events like concerts and sporting events like the Olympics, and even closing schools and daycare centers in those communities that are hit particularly hard. These five measures, including school closures, have already been put into place in China, Japan, Italy, and South Korea to some extent, and they were particularly strict about them in China. It's not clear that Americans would even allow the degree of infringement on freedom of movement that China enacted, so it's kind of hard to say what effect those, uh, those actions might have here, but I, I think we should expect some work in school closures here in the U.S. and in the rest of Europe as well. Now, coming up with formal plans for these types of closures, it takes time. So if your school or your company or your own family doesn't have a plan yet, they need to start working on one. 
It might not become necessary. Hopefully it won't become necessary, but this is not the kind of thing you want to throw together at the last minute. Whereas the previous containment strategies were primarily the responsibility of public health departments and national governments, mitigation strategies like social distancing and frequent hand washing, these are primarily the responsibility of individuals and local schools and small businesses. These involve a lot of people who don't have the necessary expertise to independently gauge risk or to independently develop a science-based response which is why it will become increasingly important for laypersons to pay attention to what experts are saying about the pandemic. As mentioned before, I know that the CDC and WHO have a bit of a credibility gap with the public right now. However, they are still among the most trustworthy sources of information, in addition to some public health experts I'm active on Twitter, who I'll be uh, listing in the video comments below. So as we've crossed into pandemic territory and we have community transmission occurring here in the US, is it time to panic? The short answer is no, it is not time to panic, but we collectively need to be more concerned than we are, or more accurately, our leaders need to be more concerned than they are. The United States is woefully underprepared for the coronavirus pandemic. For one thing, last May, John Bolton, as National Security Advisor, he eliminated the post of Senior Director for Global Health Security and Biothreats, who sat on the National Security Council. Now that might sound like an esoteric job title, but that person, they were the one in charge of coordinating a national response here in the U.S. to a serious pandemic. Our Vice President, Mike Pence, has been tasked with leading coronavirus response efforts, despite the fact that he has absolutely no relevant experience. Mick Mulvaney, the White House Chief of Staff, is calling the virus a hoax. Larry Kudlow, the director of the National Economic Council and a member of Pence's coronavirus response team, has falsely claimed the virus is contained. And President Trump, of course, continues to tweet out nonsense that's confusing the public and downplaying the severity of the situation. Now, keep in mind, I'm not, I'm not commenting here on the Trump administration generally. This is not about whether Trump is a good or bad president overall, or whether one supports traditional Republican or Democratic uh, policies. I am only talking about coronavirus, the biggest public health threat to the United States since at least the 2009 H1N1 flu pandemic, and a threat which still has the potential to become much, much, more, uh, much, much worse than that if we screw up our response, which our country is currently doing. I don't want to sound alarmist about any of this. If you have seen my prior coronavirus videos, you know that I was not particularly concerned this might grow into a global disaster. But COVID-19 has proven harder to contain than SARS. While no one is predicting that the COVID-19 pandemic represents an existential risk to humanity, it still might infect millions of people and disrupt society for months. It's neither a hoax nor an apocalypse, but it is here, it's serious, and we all need to deal with it. Every person in the world shares some responsibility at combating this disease, even if it's just washing our own hands frequently, not going to work when we're sick, and choosing to not spread virus-related conspiracy theories and false information online. Anyway, that's it for today. Stay healthy, stay safe, and if you want more periodic coronavirus updates, subscribe to this channel. I'll be posting another update soon. And as always, we'll also be posting videos on a variety of other medicine topics that might be of interest. Thanks for watching.